Options A proposed FY 2023 budget, Dr. Casey. Good afternoon, members of the board and the public and all the staff that's behind me and, and welcome to our school uh, board and superintendent and their staff in the audience as well. I'll just make this brief. As the county administrator, today is the day of the release of the balanced proposed county administrator's budget. I reiterate, propose. It's subject to, again, the community meetings and public processes, and you're hearing from a variety of officials over the next month or so, uh, leading to a public hearing on March 23rd, and then a scheduled adoption date, uh, April 6th. Uh, you know, again, we are still working with state estimates. We're still working with, again, our large investment of school and county resources into the workforce retention, recruitment, reward type systems, uh, and the continuation of our teacher and public safety sworn officers, including uh, the rest of our civilian works uh, staff that uh, we've been working on a joint study. You'll hear, uh, and you've heard once before, about many of our relief programs and some of the announcements of, again, continued relief we're trying to do on the real and personal property and vehicle registration fees of our uh, citizens. And you've also heard uh, before about the capital improvements program and the significant referendum that we're positioning in front of the people. So without further ado, though, I, again, today is the day that you're going to hear the details as much as possible on the expense side of the shop. And uh, first and foremost, our largest investments with the schools. Uh, therefore, again, we will start with the schools. And I think Dr. Tylus may be the, the initial person to start that conversation. So Dr. Tylus, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Casey and Welcome. Mr. Chair, board members. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I'm actually here to bring up as an intro person, um, we've got our school board chair who's actually going to speak today. So where we had an original proposal, obviously the school board has approved what was brought forward and it felt very appropriate that she is able to be here to articulate this. Obviously she made staff do a lot of work too, so I don't want to think that you thought we were slouching <laughs> at any time. Um, and Dr. Darty was very much engaged in our conversation up until now, too. However, Ms. Coker felt this would be a good time for her to come to address from the school board to the Board of Supervisors. So um, at this point, I will move her forward. Well, Chair to Chair, uh, welcome, Ms. Coker. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, board members, Dr. Casey. It is my privilege today to be able to uh, present the school board's approved FY23 operating budget in CIP. At the end of this presentation, the team behind me and I will be able to answer any questions that you may have. The superintendent's budget focused on three primary principles, investment in our workforce, investment in our student needs, and investment in infrastructure. Our primary focus has not changed and remains compensation and student growth within our county. In January, the superintendent came to the school board with a needs-based budget that included $23.4 million funding gap. Throughout the school board's budget process and by working with the county, we have reduced that funding gap to $8.5 million. We did that through additional county revenue, a conservative addition to state revenue, as we all know the House and Senate are still in budget negotiations, and taking a hard look at some of the line items to really put our focus on compensation and student growth. For some of the adjustments made, we were able to look at other funding sources to accomplish. And we have made no adjustments to compensation and student growth because we do feel those are the critical need for our school division. As of February 22nd, we are projecting an overall revenue increase of $67.7 million for FY23. The county transfer is currently increased by $18 million. The state increase is due to increased student enrollment, partial funding of teacher pay increases, and additional state incentives to further support education. As I stated before, we are still waiting for the House and Senate to finalize their budget negotiations so we can have a clearer picture of where this number will land. This next slide is a summary of our revenue and expenditures. Our expenditures once align, again, once align with our three primary priorities. Roughly $60 million will be invested in our workforce 
through salary studies one and two, and a little more than $18 million will be invested to support our students and student growth. We are expecting around 1,500, a 1,500 increase in our student enrollment next year. This includes also an increase in our ESL population and services. The $18 million is also an ongoing investment in our summer school and recovery of learning, as this is heavily needed as we move past the pandemic. We also have market-based wages increased for our substitute teachers. This was something we were able to pilot this year and increased our substitute pay, and it was a huge success. Around $6.6 .6 will be invested into infrastructure that is primarily going to debt services and would like to take a moment now to thank the county and the board for fully funding our SRP, which has allowed us to free up $10.9 million of our operating budget and put towards debt services and our increase in bus driver pay, which again, as you all know, was also a huge success for us as well. And then the $2.5 million line item there for maintenance of existing services, those cover things like health care costs. This slide and our next slide will reinstate priority number one of our um, compensation for all staff. This slide focuses on the continuation of salary study number one and emphasizes the importance of our teachers. It is no secret that we have a national teacher shortage and Chesterfield County is not exempt to this, from this, sorry. We need to act now to ensure teachers and other staff will look to Chesterfield County to have their long lasting careers. Last year, we collectively took the critical step of addressing decompression, and this year the focus from the Siegel study was to start addressing market competitiveness. With the state's recent proposed 5% pay increase, which, in raise, which raised the entire Virginia teacher salary market by 5%, and then the study further recommended a 2.8% market increase and around a 1.1% 1 .1 step increase to close the market gap. This annual pay increase on a per teacher basis will be between 8.6 and 8.8%. Our minimum bachelor level starting salary would now be $49,500. And we must position ourselves to attract and retain high quality teachers and staff this concept benefits the entire county. And phase two of salary study number one will get us to that goal. The second study impacts all other CCPS employees and takes a very similar approach to the teacher study. Phase one addresses compression and shifts us closer to market for pay. The $23.6 million remains an estimate as we wait for the finalization of the pay study. Currently, this $23.6 million focuses on positions not included in salary study number one, like custodians, food service, clerical, administrative, instructional assistants, and other student support positions, as well as includes a market adjustment for those positions as well. This study will also make the CCPS minimum wage $12 an hour. Schools and county, I believe we are in very similar positions here for this year as this was a joint study for both of us. These are crucial positions to our organization and greatly impact the day-to-day -day running of, school, of our schools and county. And once again, we must position ourselves to attract and retain high quality staff. In your last meeting, we heard a request from Ms. Haley and Mr. Holland about actual CCPS expenditures per capita and per student. We thought we would, we would provide this data to you now. We used county data. This slide here shows where this information came from. We used county data for the information along with inflationary metrics based on consumer price index. So we have four graphs that I'll cover now. Um, this first one, this slide and the next one, looks at school spending per capita or per Chesterfield County resident and reflects our cost to our citizens 
with the $8.5 million deficit not included. So a few things to note. The red portion of the bar reflects local reoccurring tax revenue from Chesterfield County, and the blue bar reflects primarily state funding. The small yellow portion reflects any one-time funding provided from the county. And as you can see, the, spur, the spending per capita has been relatively flat since the Great Recession, both on the overall budget financial picture, but county funding as well. Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Haley. Um, and Ms. Coker, question, um, mm -hmm. does this include debt service monies? I'm going to, yeah, thank you. Mr. Meister says it does, yes. Thank you. Uh, this graph is a very similar picture, but shows the FY23 budget deficit of $8.5 million being fully funded, and it gets us much closer to the line and keeps us consistent in per capita spending across the years. This slide will look at school spending per number of enrolled students in CCPS and reflects the cost to our citizens with the $8.5 million deficit, again, not included in this slide. A few notes worth mentioning are that our demographics have shifted in the past 10 years with an increase in ESL and special education students. Chesterfield County students who qualify for free and reduced lunch have increased by 35% in the last 10 years. Chesterfield County English learner, language learners have increased by 157% in the last 10 years. And students receiving special education services have increased 15% in the last 10 years. Our funding needs per student have increased in order to meet the population that we are serving. This last graph shows the per student basis with the $8.5 million deficit uh, being fully funded. Once again, we have to take into account the ever-changing demographics of our schools when we look at this graph. And these four graphs that were shown could be a good basis for a great conversation. I believe Dr. Casey mentioned it in your session for our next county schools liaison committee, if we would like to discuss them further. To recap, we have three funding priorities, investing in our workforce with strong focus on compensation, investing in our students with a strong focus on student growth and the recovery of learning, and investing in our infrastructure. We still have a few unknowns as we do not know where the state will end up with their final budget and with the salary study too not being finalized. But I'd like to take this time to thank the county for having us here today and collaborating that both in the collaboration that we have done so far. Local government works best when school boards and board of supervisors are actively coll collaborating together, and that is what we are doing in Chesterfield County. We can't wait to have our, this budget fully funded and because we, we know we are really facing teacher shortage, staffing challenges, student growth that we need to address now. We strongly feel that any more adjustments to the approved school board budget will have a direct impact on our day-to-day -day operations. Switching gears, moving on to our CIP update. We have been really pleased with the progress on the CIP and appreciate the partnership that we have done to get us here. Our collective plan addresses many needs, including five new or rebuilt elementary schools, four new or rebuilt middle schools, one new high school, and one high school addition. We're looking forward to working together on the upcoming referendum and making this very exciting list of projects a reality. So here's the list of projects. These projects will be funded by either the planned referendum, VPSA loans, or other savings. As you can see, the plan for funding is on the right side of the slide. The defined timeline list of projects include Falling Creek Middle, the new West Area Middle, the rebuild of A.M. Davis Elementary, and the rebuild of Bensley Elementary. You'll see that there's a list of undefined timelines for a list of projects that we will evaluate in future years based on our ever-changing environment. Those listed here are the 360 West Elementary, the rebuild of Melothian Middle, 
the new 360 West High School, the rebuild of Grange Hall Elementary, and the addition and consolidation of the Thomas Dale High School campus, the new Old Hundred Number 2 Elementary, and the consolidation of the Matoaca Middle Campus. We're very excited for these projects, and I think it's great to have these new buildings in our schools and within our county. So again, thank you for having us here today, and I now will open it up for any questions, and if I can't answer them, my team behind me will. <laughs> thank you. Madam Chair, any questions of our chair of the school board? Yeah, I just want to thank you for being here today and thank you all for working with us so collaboratively over the last couple of years. Teach a pace study. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a tremendous amount together in terms of maintenance for schools, so I applaud you and the collaborative relationship we've had with you. Uh, one thing I would like in the coming days is to see the trend and the number of students enroll in CCPS uh, this year versus last year, maybe three years. Uh, if I may receive okay. that, that would be great. Okay. I think we can pull that. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Uh, what is the um, current um, percentage of households in Chesterfield with school-aged children? Do we have that number? We can get that actual number. Uh, I recall it somewhere being in the, in the school-aged children households was in the low 30% range, 30 to 35%, but let us get that actual number. Thank it's, you. it's in the census. Yeah, I, just, I was trying to keep in mind that some of these demographic trends over time as we um, look at the funding, it's a per, per household with that sort of a decline uh, is actually resulting in, in more funds available to, to students on the, on the ground, so to speak. So I was just, just thinking about that. Um, any, did you have a question, Ms. Haley? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I'm sure my comment will not surprise you, but I think that it's important as we are getting bombarded with emails um, regarding what our position is going to be as we approach this tax, the tax rate in consideration of, you know, the real real estate revals and the um, the monies, the surplus monies. The, I don't want to say surplus, the monies that we're seeing, and as we're balancing what this looks like for future, um, and. You know, my concern noted is that in looking at your numbers, you're looking at a, a growth on the school side of $59 um, million in compensation, in that compensation bucket, and the sustainability of that number. And so I, I think it's important that folks recognize that while we are absolutely committed on both sides here to our employees, that we are mindfully, um, cautiously approaching this from the perspective of you know, the building a base of expenditures that needs to be sustainable, both sustainable in um, in the market, but but sustainable in that we never want to have to go back like we like has happened in the past. Luckily, with previous boards that I wasn't a part of, but I, I think Mr. Holland has a more vivid memory than that, and having to ever take back. And so I think that you know, if anything, I'm just making a statement to our community to say this board is absolutely partnering with you and I appreciate that um, the commentary and the approach and we've had these ongoing conversations of about the sustainability because we want to make sure we're attracting the best and keeping the best and never having to go back and um, and and dial back what we've done in resources so it has nothing to do with the values of any because if we had the open checkbook that none of us ever have but um, I think that this board is facing the same issues through our budget presentation this afternoon of making sure that what we're doing is a sustainable uh, marketplace so yeah. thank and, you and very much I definitely appreciate the collaboration that we have done so far and I think we can continue to, to work together to you know make some of this a reality so I really appreciate it Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Durkin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Casey. Um, I'm here this afternoon to give you an overview of the operating and expense side of the 23 budget. Um, you'll see all the steps as we go through these slides, but this budget before you today really focuses around four themes. Um, 
historic investment in schools and employee recruitment and retention, the upcoming referendum and the broad tax relief. Um, as we go through this presentation and some of the presenters after me, these will be fleshed out in further detail. Um, this is something new that we've done this year. As you know, the document is full of numbers, but you know, as you say, a picture speaks a thousand words. To me, this picture speaks a thousand line item details. When the team brought this to me, it really drove home um, how our expenditures across all our funds are portioned out. Um, as you can see there, the lion's share is the schools fund at 51% of our entire operating budget, which this year is projected to be about $1.77 billion, um, about $185 million over last year's budget. The general fund, is, that is net of the transfer to the school system, as you recall, that is the largest line item expenditure in our budget. And then the utilities makes up the third. And between those three, um, that makes up over three quarters of the growth that is coming in the budget over the next year. Again, another way of looking at the general fund expenditure summary. Um, as I just said, the largest component of that is our schools transfer, just under 41% of our general fund, um, with public safety coming in second at about a quarter, and then our capital expenditures at just over 9%. Basically, this is another way of, you've seen the dollar bill in the years past. This is just another way of looking at it. Between those three categories, that represents over three quarters of the general fund expenditures dedicated to these three parts alone. Um, our transfer to, um, sorry, excuse me for a second. Um, the general fund growth on this slide, sorry. Um, this is what the driver of the $98 million increase in our general fund budget is this year. Um, you'll see that the largest component in this is $35.6 million, which is investments in our workforce. You'll hear from Ms. Martin Selby later on how we propose to do that. But that is um, primarily around the general employee pay plan and the public safety pay plan. The infrastructure and facilities is just about $33.5 million. That does include about $13.4 million in one-time expenses. That's largely driven by um, the share of warehouse facility between us and schools at $8 million, and the E911 phone system replacement at $4 million, and then about one and a half towards security upgrades at the jail and the court system. And the other thing to point out in this chart is our transfer to schools is going up by $18 million last year. But if you factor in the payoff that we made with the SRP um, at $27 million, that really is an effective increase year over year for the school system of $28 million, the largest that we've done in our history. And then the block at the bottom there for the additional funding requests, we do have these every year, but with a broad emphasis on tax relief and employee retention, that is lower than in years past. I will walk through those in the next few slides. But what I will say is a large component of that is driven by contract obligations that we cannot get out of. Um, we do make a concerted every effort every year to really look at these additional funding requests. We have, for the first time, um, published those that have been unfunded but requested by departments. And that came into about $18 million. That is not to make a judgment on them and to say that they're not worthy of additional funding, but with those competing pools in our tax dollars, we had to really prioritize what we decided to fund. But as I say, it is in the back of our document this year for everyone to see that we do have unmet needs that we were just not able to fund. Then you see tax relief. That is primarily a tax relief for the elderly and disabled. We do project that to grow about 9.9% .9 per year. As you recall, a couple of years ago, it actually grew by 18%. So this program does grow at quite a fast clip. Um, I will talk further later on about our liabilities, but you'll see the long-term liability is about 1.1, especially as we implement these pay plans, um, our retirement obligations will go up, so we do factor in some growth in those expenses to make sure that our funded status um, remains on course. And then lastly, the past two expenditures, that's really just um, driven primarily by our hotel collection receipts that go to the convention center downtown. As you're all aware, tourism has been bouncing back and our um, hospitality industry has been doing really well. So that's just a reflective increase in that revenue source. Um, this is the, I will say, the one page of the entire document I spend all my time on. Um, the five-year plan, the budget that is before you today, has been stress tested. We are able to commit to all of these things through the five-year plan. We are not in the business of doing putting stuff in one year and hoping for the best in the out years. We do make a concerted effort to do this. Um, the revaluation growth, Mr. Bonefield and I have been up here before. 
we do forecast that going back down to that kind of three, three and a half percent growth in the out years. Um, we do see this year as a kind of an anomaly in the market as what's happened nationwide. Sales tax, again. Mr. Chair, Sorry. You, you might have Sailing. to say that again, just so oh. our citizens really hear that, because I think there is some noted concern about the um, kind of the anomaly that does exist this year. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I repeat it again, this is not just a phenomenon that's unique to us, it has happened nationwide. It's just, it's not built on the kind of subprime crisis that we had in the last time. It's just a mis mismatch between the nexus of supply and demand. But as the market kind of readjusts itself, we do see that going back and following national trends back to a kind of more steady state pace of about three and a half percent. Um, local sales tax, um, as you know, the last couple of years has caught everyone by surprise. It's been, um, it's held up pretty strong, it's been growing at quite a fast clip. But again, that is another one as things begin to normalize. Our five year plan assumes that that comes back to a normal steady state of growth, not at an accelerated pace. And then personal property tax, I'll touch on that in kind of one of the points of our tax relief slides. Again, that has been going up um, quite significantly over the last year. People have recently just received their assessments. Um, but as supply chain issues begin to fix themselves, we do expect that to begin to normalize again. And have brought that back down to kind of 5% growth year over year, which is what we've typically seen in the past. And the compensation plans, including the ones from last year, are built into this model for each of the five years and feeds through. Um, our major maintenance and capital contributions um, have been stepping up our pace on those. And as uh, we head into the referendum, really made a concerted effort to invest in those areas. And then school system and the out years, what we have programmed primar preliminary just now is about $17 million year over year increase. One thing, I think, back to that prior slide, yes, you have a transfer of $17 million annually. We want to also relate that to the student growth as well. That's why I asked the question earlier regarding the number of students in the school system. And I noticed the exceptional needs that were mentioned, but I still believe we need to look at the numbers and how they grow relative to the dollars because we want to think about that in terms of population growth, student growth, and, of course, the dollar growth. Uh, and budgets to the school system. So thanks for that comment sure. annually. Um, so we've kind of, as I say, with the additional funding requests, made some really targeted investments for this year's budget. Um, they kind of coalesce around six core themes and emphasis on customer service. These are some of the things that are in with the additional funding requests. The first one being the taxpayer portal. Um, that will allow to build digital engagement with the taxpayers um, via email and other messaging tools and really reducing our reliance on the kind of traditional methods including mail, so saving some costs there. Um, the new system also provides the platform for business licenses and data submission and exemption applications through that system. Um, communications and media, um, as you know, we've stepped up our efforts with uh, citizen engagement and communication, that two-way dialogue that we'll have, including with the, the budget work sessions that are coming over the next couple of weeks. But, you know, we've had the podcast and behind the mic, um, their blogs, really promoting that so that citizens can keep engaged um, with everything that's going on in the county. So this budget proposes two positions for communications and media. Um, and constituent services, you're aware of all the great work that Ms. Spillman has been doing. Um, we are proposing this budget to add an additional position for that, to really step up our efforts in those areas and keep the engagement with our delegation and um, representation downtown. Um, in the planning department, we have a plans review team that will be getting an additional position um, starting in January of the um, fiscal 23. They'll primarily review building permits and um, backup application process and duties, um, just to really speed up our process and time and customer service for our planning applicants. Second one is investment in support services. Um, this month I'll be up here in a minute, but just kind of to dovetail with um, all the pay plans. Um, fiscal year 23 budget does include some funding for an internship program. You know, we like people to come here and we like them to stay here and also to develop that new pipeline of employees moving forward, so we do have about $44,000 in there that will be spread across departments. Um, the Employee Medical Centre has really um, been highly in demand in the last two years from both county and schools, and this budget does 
propose, um, including a customer service representative and a nurse practitioner, to uh, increase our clinic staffing needs for both the county and school employees. Is that a need, uh, Gerard, that you see um, sustaining itself post-pandemic? And of course, we hope we are post post pandemic uh, bound here, but um, uh, is that something you see long term that, that posi those positions uh, sort of been able to sustain themselves and justify themselves from a budgetary perspective? Yes, I do. Um, I don't have the data right at hand, but um, I know if they bring a lot of services in house, that reduces our costs if our employees go elsewhere outside of the employee medical center. So just from a kind of cost savings benefit analysis, then yes, I do see that being a sustainable position. In there. Um, in, in our IST department, um, desktop support position, um, you know, we've had the implementation of our PC refresh program in the last few years um, and the transition to a remote workforce. This is to help them in those efforts as that um, program continues. And, you know, we're in that new hybrid state that I don't see as going back to the five days a week in the office situation. Um, in the real estate department, an assistant director position. And that'll just really provide additional management for the department as it adapts to the new, newly implemented camera system and as it continues to modernize its services. And then finally, in the accounting department, a conversion of a part-time to full-time in the financial systems. And you know that's really the backbone of our, all our operations, um, including the CIPs and upgrade to the ERP systems. That's just really a complement to all those endeavors that they're making right now. And again, another service that's going to benefit both the county and the schools. In public safety, um, Chief Centre's here. He'll be up in a few minutes to talk about um, fire and EMS in particular. But some of the um, areas that we've continued to invest in public safety, um, community corrections, I saw Mr Hughes here earlier. We are proposing um, two additional positions for him, a probation officer and technician, to respond to the growing workloads in the department. Um, for some context, during fiscal year 21, the department received over 4,000 supervision placements. So they have a heavy workload that this budget will hopefully begin to address. Uh, emergency communications, technology maintenance, um, that will begin in fiscal year 24, but that's related to the CAD system. It costs approximately just under a million dollars. Fire, as I say, is about 1.4. Chief Central will speak to those. Um, but in the police department, um, they've had some temporary authorised positions over the last few years. We are proposing to make those permanent over a wide variety of areas. Um, they have a fingerprint system upgrade, and then um, they have the police service aid expansion. It currently, I believe, is at 19 positions. We will increase that by three positions each year, again, coming back to that recruitment pipeline that we've talked about with the internship programme on the county side. Then the sheriff, um, he will be receiving one full-time, one part-time warrant specialist for record rooms operation. Some of it actually took a tour of the jail last year and he took us into that room and I couldn't believe when you walked in just floor to ceiling with papers and warrants. Um, so that is a definite need for that agency. So we are including that in this proposed budget. There's a workforce deputy um, that will supervise inmate work crews around the county. Um, a jail nurse practitioner is included in the budget. Um, that will help to provide the medical director with support for day-to-day -day facilities. Um, just for some statistics behind that one, um, they have conducted over 6,000 evaluations, um, over 870 mental health referrals and screenings annually, over 10,800 sick call visits annually, and over 8,400 prescriptions filled and tracked annually in the jail. And enhancing the quality of life, um, a lot of these have been built into the budget that we uh, adopted last year, but they are continuing on, coming back to that five-year plan. We had built them in that plan last year. This is the second part of that implementation. Um, Parks and Rec, there's been heavy investment over there in the last few years, but this will be the second phase of the athletic field crew and equipment replacement funding. They'll be receiving an additional three positions in fiscal 23 and another three in fiscal 24. Library materials, um, especially with the popular materials that are on hold, we are including um, 75,000 per year to bring that hold queue down so that people can access um, the more popular books in the system. And then the continued conversion of our part-time to full-time. As you recall, when we started this endeavor, it was kind of a two to one ratio of part-time to full-time staff. Over the course of those five years, that will reverse that and we'll get them an additional 36 positions over the five-year plan to address that issue. 
And then for the SNAP and social services, um, that will enhance training and improve employment and sales sufficiency for our program recipients. And this is just the county match at $27,000, um, and the state will cover the rest of that increase. And then Child Advocacy Centre will receive one full-time mental health outpatient clinician um, to provide direct access for treatment and services of children and families who've experienced trauma. Then strengthening our infrastructure and facilities. Um, in this budget, there is about $281,000 in our increase in local contribution to GRTC, GRTC to fund the um, Route 82 Express to provide improved access between the county and downtown Richmond. In buildings and grounds, as we make these capital investments over the next five years, we do have to... I got, I got one question yeah. on, the, on the GRTC piece. Um, uh, has a CVTA begun funding those sorts of expenditures? Um, because I think that's certainly something that we expected I want to speak too broadly here for the board, but I think that's something we expected to happen at, at some juncture. I just want to try to get an understanding of where we are on that. Mr. Winslow, if you don't mind, and, and I know Mr. Carroll okay. serves on the CVTA, and I think he would concur. The process of the CVTA's governance, if you will, over budget resolutions, and as specified by the Code of Virginia, is, is pretty explicit. I think what we will be doing with the new convening, the governance, if you will, of the three localities, that hopefully will be at the table come you know, mid-April will be again that, that, that link, if you will, to CVTA of the three localities, which again are in essence primarily consuming uh, all of, uh, of the allocable CVTA revenues right now. Having said that, the CVTA is nine localities and again, uh, to GRTC's credit, they're doing a micro transit analysis that they're gonna report back up to CVTA. So, uh, for things like this, if we have new routes, new programs, some of them pilots, some of them, you know, again, federal grants have helped us out in the past to go through a pilot exercise. I think that, again, at the end of the day, if the demands and volumes of these, uh, these uh, pilot studies are worthy and can compete with, again, the overall GRT system for its goals, then, it, then that's part of a, GR, a new GRT type, type analysis that needs to be done with, again, the CVTA's wisdom involved. So, that is, I'm speaking in the future tense, but things like this are, are gonna very much more have an advanced process, but so when we're presenting it to you as a board, concurrently it also may be debated upon by the CVTA and GRTC. Please, Mr. Kirk. I remember correctly, I think it was, you can correct me if I'm wrong, about $10 million that was part of their funding that they're actually trying to figure out what they're gonna utilize for um, regional transportation and it's part of you know the first year of monies that they actually took in they actually banked um they were able to do that because of the covid dollars that they had um and that's the way their budget process works but nevertheless there is a difference in that funding outside of the money that richmond gives them the henrico gives them and we are actually already give them that could be utilized for these type of things and certainly as we discussions move forward and results come back, then these are the type of questions that we'll be bringing you forward and hopefully getting funded. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you. Um, and then finally, you'll see at the bottom there our information systems technology implementation of a Microsoft cyber security package. As you know, that's um, an area that we've heavily invested in, in the last couple of years, especially with some federal relief dollars. Um, and Microsoft actually came to us um, with this proposal and it's to receive funding over a five-year plan to take advantage of a um, federal partnership to basically accelerate the implementation of a kind of whole suite of cybersecurity packages. And we were able to work with Microsoft to shift those costs around so that actually in fiscal year 23, there is a zero cost to the county of that. And the cost will kick in in fiscal year 24, about $370,000 with some you know annual increases after that. But we have that, again, coming back to that five-year plan inbuilt in there, so that will help step up our capabilities on that front. Then on the referendum, uh, Mr. Harris presented to you a couple of weeks ago about this, but just to touch on it really quickly, is you know we're the 540 million referendum, the 165 million dollars for us, um, we were able to program that in from a debt service perspective from seven years to five. That doesn't mean all five; it will happen all in five years, but from a financing side, we can make that happen. And we'll see that kind of slow step up that kind of peaks in fiscal, fiscal year 28 and then 
drives off after that. Then um, to come back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with the general fund spending per capita, we kind of narrowed in in the last 13 or so years. Um, you can see the impacts of the recession. We've started to kind of tick upwards, but we are still below um, that average post-recession that we had um, in 2008, 2009. Um, and the school slide that had this, I had just seen this for the first time a few minutes ago, so this is just our interpretation of this. We look at this, it's a metric we've done for years on our side, inflation adjusted. We did this for um, our school's side. You can see that drop off from about $4,400 per student in fiscal year 29. Again, not back to where it was in the post-recession average, but it is pretty close. Um, but we have, you know, certainly done our fair share of that, of funding that in the last few years. Thank you. Mr. Durkin. Yes, Dr. Casey. Oh. All right. Oh. I'm sorry, like you both talked to at me. the same time. Looks like he's <laughs> referring to me, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Um, and so I, I, I think that, again, coming from, to, just to share with my colleagues on this board as well, and I know Mr. Engel has heard me, and, and both of us have talked about this, what, you know, what spending per student looks like into the future. When you recognize that, um, I think with kudos to our school system, they are looking at how the delivery of education becomes and they are, they are looking at what will be permanently a virtual model for those students that excel on a virtual platform. And you know, I think the questions that we have posed to them have, have been what does that, you know, while you're getting the same federal and state dollars counting that student in a seat, you're not providing a building, you're not providing the same overhead. What do those costs look like? How does that affect the bottom line of delivery of education, um, as well as the opportunities to engage in partnerships throughout, just as exist with um, uh, what will now be, I guess, Bright Point. Am I saying that right? Yeah, Bright, Bright Point. Point. I have to get used to that. Um, and other models that are going to uh, possibly. So, so there's a challenge there as to why we're looking strictly at costs and spending per student, the ability of those monies to be spent in unique ways and be spent on differential platforms to provide even more opportunities for education. And I think that that's a message that we've been trying to send um, in liaison, and, and Mr. Engel can correct me if I'm wrong on that or add to that, um, but that's the message we've been trying to send is, no, it's not just anymore, you know, to Mr. Holland's comment, looking at what the growth number is in students. You know, what is that number? And then how many of those students projected will be truly just virtual learners? And, um, and what, those, what it costs to educate a virtual learner versus educating a student in a classroom. So I think there's, this is very interesting, but I think that we may have to start asking questions differently as we assess that data and assess how those monies get spent. And that's a challenge um, to our colleagues on the school side too, as to their, when their presentations come to us about needs and spending. Mr. Holm. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, along that line, I concur fully in that what we see here is, and you helped me to articulate it, is that we see an increase in funding inflation adjusted to our school system per student. So we are not defunding or less funding less. We're actually funding more each year our school system uh, due to growth as well as due to increased spending. And of course, one question I failed to ask of our school officials that you all should get from me is, of that gap, the $8.5 million, what is that intended to be spent on? And that's something, Mr. Harris, uh, we would like to see and hear after today. What, what are we foregoing or 8.5? It's okay. Yeah, it's all. It's all compensation. All compensation. Okay. Yeah, we want to be aware of that. And I did see a comment on capped, and I want to be very careful that we are looking at funding that is sustainable beyond this year and next year, because that's a fixed cost that is incurred, which has other ramifications relative to FICA, uh, uh, 
taxes as well as other taxes that we match. So there are additional costs associated with that as well. So I think that's important to note. But thanks for sharing the per pupil spending inflation adjusted. And while we're talking about schools, another thing is I think that a virtual versus non-virtual is very important because we're talking about uh, school overcrowding. I know I saw three schools last night that I looked at that were overcrowded, Cosby being the biggest, and then of course two others. Uh, you know, we, we need we need to know what plans are in place to alleviate the overcrowding. And I think that's so very important for us to look at uh, as we consider spending and where we're spending the dollars. But we have to be able to uh, sustain th those fixed costs as we go down the road. Thank it, it, you, Mr. Holland. Just a quick note on this chart that's on the screen now. So this is just the local component. The, the, the school materials that were presented, you know, we'll, we'll get those and, and take a look at them and, and try to standardize them a little bit. But this, this is a chart, I think, to Ms. Haley's point from previous meeting. We've used this for 10 years. And this is just looking at the local decisions, which would be, you know, very similar to what you saw on the, the county side. So you see a nice upward trajectory here. Those were a little more flat, but I think that's probably a little bit uh, more reflective of the fact that state funding has been static, whereas we have been, or at least on a per student basis, uh, really ramping up, especially the last four budgets. If you look at the, the shape of that line, it's almost a 45 degree angle. So, Thank you, uh, Mr. Harris, and I thank Mr. Carroll. Uh, Mr. Chair, one of the things I, I should have asked it in the school presentation, but uh, in, I think in Stratus they showed 5,700 or 5,900 students, something like that as an increase. In, through 2026, is that right? Uh, and my question is, did Stratus take into consideration the fact that yeah. we have several private schools that are going to be opening in uh, Chesterfield? And I know one of them is a 1,200 student school with at least 100 students for each age group. So was that part of the calculation that Stratus looked at in estimating uh, the increase? Uh, Ms. Carroll, no, sir. I mean, the, the way that the model's built just from a a uh, mathematical perspective, it's it's taking historical trends and looking for patterns and then sort of extrapolating out. So, uh, you know, it doesn't have anything to learn from, from previous, you know, if we'd had a period where it dropped in some private schools, we could have built that in. Uh, that will be incorporated in the model as it sort of rolls on and learns what happens in that particular instance. But yeah, that would be something that we can make a after, you know, sort of production adjustment to that to to factor that in, but the model itself, it, you, you just can't train it based on those types of developments, unfortunately. I think it's safe to assume some students that are generated, that Stratus predicts will be generated, will be taken in by, uh, private, by private schools, and that's, I think that's a, an ongoing assumption, Mr. Engel. Does this chart take into consideration debt service? It, this, this chart is, is on a, yes, this is all in, all ex expenditures, and this is our portion that would, you know, go towards that. And when schools shows their charts, they don't show debt service, correct? The, well, I, you know, in, in slight defense of the division, the, the standard way that that is I mean, evaluated. no schools right, in the exactly. whole state. I'm not yeah, picking I don't, I don't, on Chesterfield I just want to make it sound schools. like it's Chesterfield. Alone, no, I'm not picking they, on our school system. Right. I'm saying that schools in the state, when they compare, they don't compare debt services. So... If they That's have correct. two or three schools in the county, their debt service is significantly lower than um, debt service on 60 plus schools in the county that um, doesn't go into that equation. But when we figure out what we have to spend, we have to count our rent, our mortgage in our um, totals. So I just wanted to make sure that people do understand that there's a lot larger number per pupil being spent than what any school system in the state says is being spent. Yes, sir. I think that they, their assistance budget advisory committee in particular posted some materials that did not have debt service layered in there. It's unfortunate. Um, but it's particularly detrimental to a locality like Chesterfield that's growing to strip out debt service because we are having to, you know, invest in capacity and in renewal the last several years. So all of that has been pulled out of those particular uh, set of charts that were shared earlier in the process. Yes, sir. What, what is the what is the rationale behind stripping debt service out of these models? I guess I just don't understand that. We're not building schools for other people. I, We're building I, them for, for students and for kids know, I, so they can learn. I think it's, uh, 
you know, my interpretation has always been fairly state driven. DOE kind of sets up, you know, that model, if you will. And I think they try to look at more instructional based activities is all I could tell you. I mean, they, they put all of the information in the spreadsheets that are out there. For some reason, they just strip it out and kind of, you know, kick it out to the side of the analysis, which is, you know, odd. Dr. Casey. I think we may start with this slide next year. Um, <laughs> but having said that, a, a couple of things in fairness to the schools, I think, in which you saw earlier, and I think Ms. Coker answered it, is that they did try to include debt service in that particular slide. So while it may not have been included in the past, and, fa and again, fairness to schools, they have many people they report to. So for the state reporting systems, it is not in there. Um, but I will say, and that's where it makes comparison so hard. So to us, the trend analysis of what Chesterfield has done, what you have done to invest in the schools, is the best comparison of apples to apples. Once we compare ourselves to somebody else, and I can speak in the first person, it's all different numerators and denominators. Because even the student population can be different. Sometimes pre-K students are included in it, sometimes not. Sometimes other students who might be in transition or students at the beginning of the year included, but not students at the end of the year. So it, there's a lot of dynamics into that. Uh, I will say, again, Ms. Coker recognized that, again, the schools have faced a lot of challenges over the last 10 plus years and the types of populations that they've had to deal with. Again, those, those challenges of that population are our challenges too. So you know, the, the, the per capita spending inflation adjusted chart that you see for the county is, is also a fairly stacked line in comparison to where we were 15, 20 years ago. And, and as the board wells knows, and we had a very good discussion just earlier today, there are a lot of shared services that we do on behalf of the school system, uh, all gratis. You know, that, that, that we, it's just part of our budget, and we don't get into the accounting exercise of keeping t track of time and, and invoices if we able to charge the schools for everything. Some jurisdictions uh, do that. And you saw in Ms. Coker's presentation, the investments you made as a one-time SRP reduction uh, in essence lowered the base budget of the schools down by over $10 million of an expense. So in essence gave them a $10 million capacity to do other things in their system that they didn't have before that really isn't reflected in the bar chart because that nets out that $10 million investment. Plus, I, you know, I can go on and on for all the mid-year changes, how you use surplus strategically to reinvest in the school. So I, I will say for the school's sake, we are trying to have a uniform way in which to present the information in our budget documents. Again, the challenge is those that take that information from state statistics create this apples to oranges comparison. I don't think we try and do that deliberately. And in fairness, I, in some respects, some of the school leadership does not. But it doesn't mean other people do not do that. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Pace. Mr. Chair, one, one more. Yes, Just to follow up on that, too, and this might be something that should have been mentioned earlier during Ms. Coker's presentation, but I think that it's really critically important to recognize that and for our citizens to understand that this board, including the school board, is very committed to make sure that our teacher salaries are on par. I think that when you see this gap in monies that exist, as, as Mr. Engel pointed out, it really is in the compensation issue. And to be quite candid even to share with our my colleagues on this board that we are absolutely at the table ensuring that, that what schools are calling maybe cabinet level positions or their highest um, directors and things are on par with our directors. I think that, that you know, quite candidly, um, the talent pool that we're um, uh, pulling from the talent of the folks that we're pulling from is absolutely equitable and that we should be talking about salary and compensation benefits for 12-month employees at that level that are fairly equitable. Last thing any of us want to see is somebody that's competing between a school's job or a county job or leaving counties to go to schools because of a pay disparity issue that exists and also that we're collaboratively looking for the strength of those positions. So some of that disparity, you know, quite frankly exists in that area and is a little bit um, concerning that, um, that, you know, that's where, so, so it does not exist in, in compensation that is existing for our teachers or our bus drivers or our folks at that level that we are absolutely in, on both sides committed to um, ensure are, are adequately compensated and are getting substantial um, compensation increases. Thank you. Good comments, Ms. Haley. I think this, this budget is, I mean, the conversation has been dominated by recruitment and retention. I mean, th those are the two themes for this year. Uh, Mr. Durkin, I'm going to hand it back to you. All right, thank you. Um, to continue down the skills path, um, you can see the chart before you. 
I know I often get in trouble for doing small font, but this one is very deliberate, I will say. <laughs> um, you know, we, this time of year we tend to focus on, you know, the transfer to the schools, that line item and that increase per year. But we have done some unconventional things in the past that provide support to the school system outside of the annual budget process. And um, you'll see that list before you right here. Um, and the operating fund, um, fiscal year 21, you know, when COVID hit, we actually had a year-over-year -year increase for the schools, despite us cutting our overall budget by over $50 million. Um, last year's increase, $18 million, was the largest on record. Again, effective with that SRP savings, the effective increase this year to the schools is $28 million. For capital, um, we've had the $58 million in major maintenance that we had issued in fall of 2020. And we just closed. You know, one second on that yep. note. I just want to point out that, that that major maintenance program dealt a lot with something Mr. Holland and I were involved with, and that was the school safety task force. And so, you know, it's easy to just say $58 million and go to the next bullet point, but okay. these are 50, not for me, but um, these are monies that have been well spent and positioned in places to add security to our school division. And, and uh, I know that's important not only for uh, the folks who work there, but also our kids who, who go to school there. So I just want to point that out, uh, Mr. Carroll. Not just, the, not just that, but it's also the, the health issues that were addressed in some of the uh, HVAC units that had occurred uh, previously where there was uh, issues. And we knew that uh, they needed to get these type of things fixed and upgraded so that we could get the kids back into schools safely so they would be in a good, safe environment. And some of that money was actually bonds that we reissued debt from in order to make sure that they had the money to do it. So, um, I mean, I think it's important to point those things out. All right, Mr. Durgan. Um, as I say, we closed on the VPSA bonds last month um, for middle school acceleration. Um, we've been able to find some extra referendum capacity for the upcoming referendum this year. Um, and on the CIP, we do have some shared projects that we are solely funding on the county side and not asking for funding from schools. That ERP system, $12 million over the next few years, $8 million for the joint warehouse, and even some of the land purchases we've made in the last year with Spring Rock Green and Upper Magnolia, sites for potential schools, we have not asked for any funding on that. Even down to how we calculate, it's not on the side, but our unassigned fund balance, it does take into account our transfer to schools. We solely fund that as one of the items that regularly appears on our year end, which will, it will again. Again, that's something that we take care of on our side entirely. Then one-time funds, you can see there, that is about $80 million worth of one-time funds from CARES, ARPA, and then coming back to that supplemental retirement program contribution. Um, Mr. Chair, one, one comment on this 20, 27 million SRP. It's my understanding that this fully funds that program. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Because I know years ago we they were contemplating should we keep a program such as this. Uh, it's my understanding one of our localities, uh, Powhatan, they did, or one locality, I shouldn't say which, decided to discard their program. Uh, and so we, we decided to fund it and to, to save it for the benefit of our teachers, uh, our school division primarily. So it is fully funded at this point. Yes. Sir. Thank you for confirming that. Thank you, for, thank you for pointing that out, Mr. Holland. I still have PTSD. Uh, Mr. Carroll. Well, just to comment on that, I think it's also important for the public to know that although the program is fully funded, it eventually will phase out, correctly? Yes. Uh, so as the people who are eligible to participate in the program phase through the program, then eventually this program will go away. Yes. The money will be there to fund it, um, but it, it's, it, with no new employees are going into this. Correct. I think it's an important factor for the public to know. That's right. As of 2013, I believe, new, uh, new employees were not um, allowed to, to continue with that. So that's a good, that's a good point, uh, Mr. Kerr. Yeah, and just the last second context, you know, in fiscal year 2016, the program was only 16.7% funded. So to get to 100% in the last few years is really quite remarkable and speaks to, you know, the actions that you've all taken to make sure that, that program's sustainable. And I might add that fully supports education in our teachers, the classroom. Thank you. Um, I'd say this is the most important slide of the entire presentation. Um, not to make it too fine a point on it, but our broad tax relief program, um, 
you know, the actions you took a couple of months ago to set the maximum tax rate at 93 cents, we were able to accommodate an extra cent reduction in this proposed budget before you. Um, personal property tax relief thresholds, um, I've said this numerous times, increased from 1,000 to 1,500. First adjustment since 1998. And one of the things that we are instituting this year in recognition of increased assessments is adjusting our Personal Property Tax Relief Act threshold. As you'll recall, that's a kind of block that we get from the state every year to put against people's personal property tax bills. That has been on a downward trend the last few years. With the current projections that I'll get into in the next couple of slides, we are able to increase that percent to grant extra relief for everybody's personal property tax bills this year. That is a cost of approximately $15 million that we were able to put in um, with fiscal year 22's budget. Our elderly and disabled tax relief, um, that was the first adjustment we've made in over a decade to all brackets to accommodate the social security increase. And then for businesses, the B poll increasing the threshold from 300 to 400,000. Two thirds of businesses are now exempt from paying that tax. And then the additional 2,000 plus businesses will see um, an average of $2,000 savings from that $100,000 increase in the threshold. And then finally, the vehicle registration fee um, is decreasing from $40 to $20. That is about the equivalent of another one and a half cents on the rate. All of that is going to road improvements in the CIP that will no longer be housed in the general fund, it'll be a straight transfer. Um, all in all, between all of these programs, we've calculated that that will be a total average relief of about $300 per household with all of these tax, um, tax relief program implementations in this, this year's budget. Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Hale. I think it's really important and, and, and maybe you just need to remind me because I am forgetful at times how we share with the elderly and disabled the tax relief amendments we make. How do we make sure that they get this message? Can somebody respond to that? Yeah, uh, no, Ms. Hale, that's a good question. So I think uh, the, the commissioner certainly uh, you know, does a good job of pushing that out. But I think you know, once we get through uh, the budget process, you know, we'll push that out again. The, the advantage here, though, to really cut to the core of your question, you guys did this in December. So all of the marketing materials and all of the application process thus far has been on that new rule book. So I think we really have gotten a, you know, a three month head start from where we normally are, whereas you guys are sometimes considering amendments at this point um, and then we're having to backtrack. We have been able to blast that out. Again, we will push it again you know, now that we're in the budget process, but I think doing it in December maybe as a new business model moving forward really allows everybody to, to pick up on that news uh, much earlier, and that's been a, a great process improvement. If I could also add to that, um, through Senior Connections and Triad, I mean, there's a lot of other entities that do outreach programs and informational campaigns to the elderly and disabled, so we also utilize those same portals. Uh, Citizen Information and Resources, again, has a, a dedicated program to being attentive to the seniors in Chesterfield County. And so, uh, you know, through all those means and manners, we, we will do our best to promote out. I think you as a board, if, and if I'm not mistaken, even via the, an ordinance you created, we're not making them go through a laborious exercise in filing every year. So once you file and make your attestation, I think your documents, again, once you turn 65, mm -hmm. in essence, you are over 65 thereafter, you know, we're making it easy. Uh, now, you may have to do an income attestation every few years. But again, because many people are on fixed incomes, we're not making them go through the inordinate paperwork uh, every year that we may have used to make them go through. A, thank you, uh, Dr. Casey. That's an excellent point, Mr. Chair. And I want to really compliment uh, the move this year on the vehicle registration fee being decreased because it complements item two, which is the increase in vehicle uh, value from 1000 to 1500 And I know I have some constituents who really will appreciate that in the Dale District. Thank you. Um, so, Go ahead. All, right. so um, all in all, um, the tax relief packages before you on this slide comes to approximately just over $52 million worth of tax relief that's in this budget, just to put it in large scale context. Repeat that number again. $52 million. $52 million. Yes. Thank so, you. That's important. Um, as you know, there's every year many unknowns, maybe this year more than most. Um, with labour market fluctuations, new data coming out this morning. 
we still have continued inflationary pressures and with some of the geopolitical unrest that we're seeing in the world, that may actually go up even further. With that said, um, we do have a conservative posture when we develop these budgets. We do retain some flexibility within them. Um, we have made some sizable increases in our PAYGO, including to their new district enhancement program and seed money for referendum projects to speed those up. Um, we do have a merit adjustment in February of fiscal year 23 in this budget as well. And then our long-term liabilities, to go back to that kind of tree slide at the beginning, we make sure we have adequate resources in there to fund those and they are above our policy requirements. And then again, with all the actions that the state, especially having not been settled, um, we take a conservative approach on those and our interest rate assumptions. So if anything were to kind of, the economic landscape, landscape sorry, were to change, we do have um, some flexibility in this budget to adjust to that. Um, I've talked about the additional funding requests, but one of the things that we don't really talk about every year that we're starting to now is that we do have many unfunded requests. Um, for the first time in the document, you will see those all published and what department, what they're for, and the amounts that have been requested. Um, that came to about $11.1 .1 million, um, included 81 positions. I believe it was north of about 140 requests that went unfunded. Again, to reiterate, that's not to say that they're not needed. We just couldn't accommodate it within this budget with all the competing pressures that we faced. Um, I won't walk through every one of these, but you can see the range from Parks and Rec to IT to our Sheriff Department. Um, and then on the capital side, it's just under a quarter of a billion dollars of requests that we weren't able to fund, including some armored vehicles for police, park sites, um, and some additional fire stations. And then we publish this every year. It's in the book again. Our transportation um, projects that are unfunded are north of $4 billion. Well, on that last item, uh, Ms. Haley and I are going to go visit the Secretary of Transportation tomorrow, and I think uh, we, we're both hoping he's generous and uh, feels, feels that he, he can help us out. Uh, so, very good. Thank you. Well, and to add to that, Mr. Chair, I, I think it's, um, you know, we're all um, candidly watching what's happening right now at our General Assembly and what decisions may be made there on budget that may actually affect transportation dollars on a statewide basis. And so we're all very um, cautious and we're very concerned about what that may be, any de decrease in transportation dollars, because I would venture to say that we are not the only locality um, <coughs> that is looking at numbers like that, though Though I think the uniqueness of Chesterfield uh, with the vast road network that we already have and the vast needs that exist in our no, uh, road network um, are somewhat unique with the population, a growing population as we have. So hopefully we can get some, have some good conversation, but we're also trying to make sure that as our General Assembly is fighting through this budget, that our transportation funds get preserved in certain ways to, um, you know, so that we don't take too big of a hit on that factor moving forward. Okay, um, even though I'm standing before you today to talk about the proposed fiscal year 23 budget, um, as you're all aware, budgeting is a year round exercise. We are still in fiscal year 22. We do keep an eye on that throughout the year, and it does inform our forecast for fiscal year 23, as well as the five-year plan horizon. Um, we have all been working on these the last few weeks. We are preliminary projecting a surplus about plus five, plus or minus five percent, really attributable to you know the dual compact of real estate and personal property tax collections. Um, some of the year-end actions under consideration, to get back to that personal property tax relief. By implementing that in fiscal year 22, that will cost about $15 million that we are able to accommodate in fiscal year 22. We do have auto reserves that we have to um, pay into every single year. That would be the first step of any surplus that would be left. The public safety pay plan contribution to ensure that that funded status remains, that would be the second drop of any year-end surplus. On a side fund balance contribution, we have to remain in compliance with that, that 8% level. As the budget grows, that number grows we have to keep um, funding that to ensure that we remain in compliance. Then kind of our long-term liabilities, our OPEB and our SRP contributions, with the pay study implementations that could be coming up to make sure that those programs are still on a sound footing, we would um, make a one-time infusion into those plans to make sure the funded statuses remain um, at the levels that they're currently at. 
Then speaking of long-term liabilities, um, just on the left, you can see the OPEB liability from 2017 through um, the end of fiscal year 21. Um, it's seen gains over the last five years, more than doubling the funded percentage in that time. And that we also knew going into the public safety pay plan implementation that the supplemental retirement program for the county would need some catch up. Um, we've identified this as a, again as a year end surplus item, as well as for the general um, government safety pay plan. And then finally, before I turn it over to Ms. Brown, um, one of those um, big components of our additional funding requests are really the growth in contractual commitments. You can see they're just below $2.1 million um, across all of the general fund. It pretty much touches every single division in the organization from IT um, to police and uh, waste and resource. And we work with the departments as best as we can um, just to see if we can accommodate those increases within their existing resources. But with inflation the way it is right now, um, we have no choice but to fund these within um, the fiscal year 23 appropriations. And so a big chunk of those additional funding requests, I say, are put towards those contracts to make sure that our service levels remain um, at the levels that our citizens expect. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Questions for members? Thank you, Mr. Brown. All right, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Casey. Procurement hasn't typically been invited to the table for these budget discussions, so this is a new one. Um, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to present to you. Um, as Mr. Durkin mentioned, there are certainly um, impacts to the budget when we are talking about the purchase of goods and services. Um, our goods and services spend um, consisted of $381.5 million last fiscal year. And of that, 45% um, was school for schools. Um, so I think it's important to mention that we are a shared service, as Dr. Casey mentioned, and we do provide services to both county and schools. Um, something of note, um, due to the procurement efforts, through the procurement competitive procurement process, as well as negotiation by our buyers, we were able to have a cost savings or cost avoidance of $22.7 million last fiscal year. Um, Highlighting our diversity spend, we had a record increase in our Chesterfield spend with Chesterfield businesses, um, an increase of 53% last fiscal year. Um, I'll highlight the emergencies because if certainly um, we are in you know, a, a, a different environment right now um, and 129 emergency purchases that consisted of $8.5 million just for historical um, Information, we are averaging the five years prior to the pandemic about 26 emergencies. So you can see the dramatic increase as well as um, workload increase that um, that had for our office. Um, I'll also uh, mention that in addition to the pandemic, we had the flood at the Addison Evans water treatment plant that also accounted for some of those emergencies. I would like to highlight a little bit of the challenges that we faced during the pandemic. Certainly you as a consumer, um, can certainly understand some of those um, constraints that we were dealing with. Uh, I'm sure you ran out to try to find toilet paper at some point and, you know, had to, to deal with, you know, uh, repairs personally or pain at the gas pump. Well, certainly that was no different for, here, for us here at the county. Um, scarcity of supplies, we had inflation, as Mr. Durkin has, has spoke on. What I'd like to highlight is the procurement response to the pandemic. Um, during the, the pandemic, we were able to pivot very quickly to a virtual environment, and we were able to um, have no delays or disruption of service during that time. We were able to collaborate with the supplier base to have um, no disruption in the needed supplies that we needed at the county or schools. We had staff working around the clock to purchase PPE that was needed um, and to supplement labor shortages that we had here at the county. Um, we had some restructuring of the department during that period of time and created an operations division, which, was a, which allowed us to really leverage technology as we pivoted to a virtual work environment. 
Um, we were looking at ways to create efficiencies, and I'll highlight um, the hard work of our team awarded us a NACO award in 20 and 21 during this time. We had uh, peers across the state looking to us to, to figure out how we were operating in this environment and navigating those challenges. Two years into the pandemic um, and, and currently with geopolitical environment, we still have unstable su supply, we have price escalation, and we have increased logistical costs and low uh, vendor response to some of our solicitations due to their labor shortages as well as supply chain issues. Um, so some examples of some of those contracts that have been impacted. We've seen delivery delays for our chemicals, for our wastewater treatment plants. We've had nursing shortages at the jail facility, um, as well as some of our, our supplemental departments that utilize nursing and schools as well. We've seen significantly longer lead times on HVAC parts. And then we've had um, some drug testing challenges and, and being able to um, have those service delivered during the current COVID environment. One of the things that procurement does to help um, offset inflation is establish requirements contracts or term contracts for the repetitive needs of goods and services. We have um, 628 contracts that we maintain on average um, year to year. And we tie those um, term renewals to the consumer price or producer price index as appropriate for the individual good or service. And that helps us control some of those costs but as you have heard from budget in a previous presentation, CPI is at a record high of 7.5% over the previous 12 months, and PPI is at a 9.7% increase. So certainly that is a challenge for us. Um, I would highlight some additional commodities that have traditionally been very stable, and we have since seen a dramatic increase in the costs associated with those goods. Um, traditionally, volatile commodities, we put in a escalation de-escalation clause, but some of these were not predicted because they have been flat for many years, and then we saw dramatic increases in the price and were unable to um, renew those contracts and had to reestablish contracts. Some of the current challenges that we continue to face is you know, inflation and the cost of various projects. I've highlighted a few that we've recently encountered. Uh, roofing, we have material shortages in that environment, and you can see the budgetary um, estimate from our engineers that were involved in that project and what the actual low bid. I won't read each of these, but you can just see um, the numbers of what we estimated and what we actually paid um, based on the low bid. We've had challenges in uh, vendors having labor to be able to fulfill their contractual duties on time, which have extended the project completion, which certainly impacts us having to administer those contracts. It um, affects the end users who are then having staff to manage those projects for an extended period of time. Um, I highlighted a, an HVAC project for comparison. Certainly there are, it's very difficult to find exactly um, like projects to compare, but these are comparable in size and scope. And you can see what we paid in 2019 versus 2021. So certainly um, escalation is a challenge for us. I want to end on a positive note. How are we responding? Certainly, we, we have, there's a lot of uncertainty in this area, but what we are doing is continuing to re, um, improve our relationship with our supplier base. They were um, instrumental in navigating through the pandemic, having those supplier relationships and being able to procure those hard to source goods and services. Um, and we want to increase our collaboration with them and think outside of the box on ways to overcome some of those challenge, challenges. Um, we want to increase our internal collaboration. Uh, Mr. Durkin and I have had extensive conversations on the contractual requirements, what CPI and PPI indexes are in specific contracts, how that affects the budget, when we have escalation clauses for volatile commodities, and certainly we'll have more increased uh, discussion on that in the future. We want to have uh, planning at division levels to really look at what markets are looking like, um, what CIP plans are in place, and how we can best use our resources for future projects. And we'll continue to increase efficiency by leveraging technology. 
and having more data to um, direct our future decisions. Um, we also will be looking at additional procurement uh, tools. We recently um, awarded a design build project for transportation for Otterdale Road drainage improvements, and we'll be looking to expand that, um, develop policies and procedures beyond transportation. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Members. Mr. Kerr. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, this is very good. I, I want, uh, one question I had was um, in your um, procurement sort of trade industry, if you will, uh, what are people saying about the coming year? Is it more of the same? Is it, uh, is it planned to level out uh, in terms of projections? What do you see? It, it's very hard to say right now. Um, we're hoping that it will level out. I think uh, procurement, as we once knew it, has, has gone by the wayside. We are having to think uh, proactively, be more strategic. That's certainly my plan, is to have a more strategic, that's why I pre appreciate being involved in the conversation today, a strategic partner in the organization and, and how we are creative in balancing and making sure the budget is, um, is, is adhered to and, and thinking creatively to solve these challenges. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. You're right, uh, it's nice to have purchase income and share, and I particularly in, uh, appreciate increased supply diversity, and that helps with competition, with lower prices, and also with quality. So we appreciate your work in that area, and I hope all is going well in your department in terms of staffing and in terms of employee morale. I hope all things are well. We are very close to being fully staffed. <laughs> very good to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. I see right that you said the increased purchasing from Chesterfield businesses was increased by like 53%? Yes, sir. That's really good. I think it's important for us to reinvest the taxpayers' dollars uh, back into the community. Uh, and so whenever we can do that, uh, I'm very much in favor of that. I think that is a testament to uh, the local supplier's ability to respond in the emergency situation. I think we relied heavily on those Chesterfield businesses to fulfill those needs during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, Dr. Casey. To assist in our recruitment and retention efforts, uh, the county conducted three pay studies, as you know. Uh, the two were finalized last year for our public safety, uh, as well as our teacher pay study. And that teacher pay study included some other school-based positions. So the third and final study is for our county employees and schools employees that were not part of the first pay study. So today I will focus on the third and final pay study. The goal today is to share some facts that were gained from the pay study regarding our pay ranges and our actual salaries. Also, we contacted county leaders about the challenges they were facing related to recruitment and retention of employees and uh, we'll share some of those insights as well. We know that addressing compensation does help in recruiting and retaining quality staff, as we saw from our public safety pay study. Uh, this slide shows you a few facts about the public safety pay plan and police in particular. Turnover has decreased across the public safety workforce. As of this morning, when I spoke to those departments, fire had four vacancies, sheriff and police both had five each. So that, that's, that's great, that's tremendous. A competitive compensation plan coupled with a great work environment or work culture, um, which our three public safety uh, leaders have certainly created in, in our county, has positioned us for long-term success. You'll hear more from the fire chief about uh, the public safety compensation uh, following my presentation. As you know, we contracted with a consultant, Evergreen Solutions, to conduct that third pay study. Uh, they've been in business since 2004. They've done approximately 400 of these studies, and you may remember that name because they also helped us with the public safety pay study. 
Important to keep in mind how minimum wage has increased as compared to actual market pay. As you can see from this slide, while minimum uh, wage may or may not increase to $15 per hour in the future, we'll have to wait and see. Entry level workers are getting $15 per hour now and in some cases even more. So the question is why is that? The impact of the pandemic along with what we've heard as the great resignation have both caused workers to leave the workplace in record numbers. So it's really now a matter of supply and demand for workers. So how does the actual market pay align with uh, salaries for Chesterfield employees? Approximately 300 of our employees earn less than $15 per hour. And that covers about 37 job titles, including those that are listed here in the bottom left of the slide. And with today's shortage of applicants for local government jobs, we're also now competing with many entry-level positions in the private sector who can offer higher hourly rage, uh, wages. Uh, and that's really a new phenomenon for us to be competing with the private sector. Uh, for many applicants, the benefits of uh, working for local government or government in general, like retirement and health care, just are not as important right now. A picture uh, on the right side of the slide shows you some retail and restaurants in our area that are offering wages higher than some of the starting salaries here in local government. So we know we have to keep pushing uh, and re-educating applicants about the importance of benefits and hopefully uh, they will at some point begin thinking beyond the, the paycheck. Uh, but that's difficult right now considering uh, the cost of gas, food, and um, many other commodities. So how did we get here causing us to have to pay attention to uh, compensation right now? We are very fortunate here in the county. We have been able to give annual merit increases for, for many years. Uh, many organizations haven't been able to do that. But those increases have been relatively uh, modest over the past 12 years and have not always uh, helped us keep pace with cost of living increases. For example, in some years, I know you've heard our employees say that their take home pay uh, may have decreased from the prior year because of increases in health care and taxes. So that also supports our need to address compensation as soon as we can. This chart shows you a side-by-side -side comparison of employees in Chesterfield and employees in a neighboring locality who we won't name, but uh, those employees have very similar jobs and very similar tenure. Uh, so uh, in each case though, in, in this particular slide, you will see that Chesterfield employees earn less than their counterparts with the same type of tenure. And I won't go through the slide, but you can see, I'll just point at the last one for you. Senior plant operators uh, here in our utilities department, there's one that has 13, almost 14 years of service and same position in the neighboring locality, same tenure, it's making about $20,000 more. And this is FY22 uh, salaries for both localities. So this chart shows you how those salaries will change after the pay study is fully implemented. As you can see, the salaries are more aligned with what we are accustomed to seeing in today's la uh, labor market. I know, Mr. Holland, we had talked about the accountant. Uh, right now, you see our accountant with five years of service making about 40000 and after the pay plan is fully implemented, they will be more at the $60,000 uh, annual salary, which is more in line with what you would find for a professional accountant. So the next slide shows you how uh, actual employees, um, I'm sorry, it shows you our pay ranges. Uh, we looked at actual employees before. So this looks at our, our market survey results. So our consultants surveyed uh, 16 organizations and they're listed on the right side, 16 localities in the state of Virginia. And the way they selected the, uh, the localities was really a number of factors, including the size of the locality, uh, if they were a known competitor of ours, the proximity to Chesterfield, and then also localities offering similar uh, services and programs, thus having similar positions. So we benchmarked 148 jobs, 
66 of the pay ranges were below market average. 24 of those pay ranges were below market average by double digits. And we listed a few of those examples in the bottom left of this slide. Also, the results of the inquiries that we had with department directors about what positions were high priority for them. There are 434 job titles in the county. Department directors listed 222 as high priority, hard to fill, and that salary adjustments were needed immediately in order to recruit and retain those employees. So this final uh, chart shows you at a very high level how we plan to address employee compensation over the next two years if possible. In addition to our standard merit increases, the one that we received in February, the one that we hope to receive next year, we'd like to implement phase one of the pay study recommendations, which include the following. As we all know, the new minimum wage is currently $11 per hour. We'd like to move most county employees to a pay plan where $12 is the minimum. 120 select positions have been identified by our department heads as being hard to fill because of starting salaries. Those 120 positions are unique to the county, meaning we don't share those job titles with schools. So we're proposing that we move those positions to the $16 minimum pay plan uh, in phase one. And since midpoint represents market uh, and what we would expect a proficient employee to uh, be earning, the plan places employees on the new pay ranges based on their years of service with the county. So that will certainly help us with reducing compression. And again, the goal is to get tenured employees to midpoint or market. Employees who are already at or above midpoint would receive a flat 5% increase to prevent compression and also to recognize them for their tenure with the county. Phase two of the pay plan would move all employees who were on the $12 minimum pay plan during phase one to the $16 minimum pay plan. So all employees would, would earn at least $16. So what does this mean? In roughly a 12-month period, we could see our non-probationary uh, county employees receiving a total of 9%, a minimum of 9%, or what we refer to as the 252 approach, a 2% merit that we received in February, a 5% hopefully sometime uh, once this plan is implemented, and then a 2% merit uh, next February. So uh, employees who are below the midpoint would, may, may receive more because, it, again, we need to get those salaries up. But that would be the floor or the minimum that we would be um, giving our employees. So that uh, concludes my presentation. And I just want to say thank you to this board for the support you all have given us as an HR department and our employees as we try to get this right for our employees. Uh, I think it's a, a good investment. It's, a, it's one that will pay dividends, uh, not only just now, but in the years to come. So thank you all so much for your support. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions? Charles? Yeah, thank you for that presentation. I appreciate your hard work. I tell you, a great HR department is, is so important. And so I applaud you all and thank you for your work that you do so diligently. Uh, one question is how long would it take us to get back to parity where we are somewhat caught up, the disparity that you outlined uh, and approximate costs? And thirdly, would it be feasible and wise to consider uh, a bonus uh, in that regard, given the disparity that we see in certain areas? So, Just a couple of questions for yes, you. Yes, sir. So uh, the way the plan is established, we can accomplish uh, getting people to competitive salaries within those two phases. Okay. So it's a matter of, you know, how long will it take us? You know, we, we hope we can do it in two years. But, of course, you know, there are budgetary you know, considerations for that. But that's the plan, is to get folks to where they need to be within a two-phase process. Thank you. Yes, sir. In, in terms of a bonus, uh, you know, we can, certainly, we can certainly look at that. But if you look at some of the increases that we'll be making, and our focus really has been on the lower leveled, uh, lower graded positions. Sure. Uh, that's, that's where we have really um, focused our attention. 
Some of those individuals are getting some really nice increases if this plan goes through, and we believe that will help them in the, in the very near future as well in phase one. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Carroll. Um, <clears throat> it's true also that <clears throat> in our workforce, we probably have many employees that are eligible to retire. Yes, sir. And by making these changes, it would be advantageous for them because probably most of them are in the old VRS system, which means they're in the highest 36 months. That's and right. So this is actually also a good retention tool for us to retain some of the brightest and long-serving employees that we have, instead of losing all that intellectual property at one time, uh, perhaps we'll retain them longer and give us an opportunity to recruit younger people and get them trained. Absolutely. Okay. We saw that with the public safety pay study when we implemented that plan um, and some of the retention increases that we did, that folks decided to stay uh, and are staying longer to get those three years that are necessary to impact your retirement benefits, which are lifetime. Yes, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and we appreciate your work on this, Dr. Casey. Yeah, just to bring some um, other perspectives to this, a couple of things that you as a board has done and, and we helped propose it was uh, we create a reserve system for all of our step-based plans, public safety sworn officers, and, and in fairness to schools have done the same, where we're filling up an account, an escrow, if you will, so when, when and if there are tougher or tight times, you know, hopefully we'll never ever say that, you know, that second year, uh, you know, police officer is making the same as a first year police officer. Because decompression, we've heard loud and clear, uh, once you have it once, it is so hard to get rid of. So to keep it from entering the workforce, even when there might be flat budgets, we are building up reserves and fund balance, cash surpluses per policy even, to be the first uses of dollars so we will, will, will not be decompressed going forward. You know, we are hopefully going to be working further with you, whether it's the liaison committee, finance committee, or chair and vice chair meetings, uh, to again work with our school counterparts. Because part of our challenge is, is that we're really working through an alignment factor of our entire workforce, where we can almost, in, in a universal way, say we want to be competitive for a starting salary. We may not always have to be the highest paid one, because sometimes others will just chase and create higher starting salaries, which lend to compression possibly. Uh, so we're working that alignment factor out with our school counterparts. And, uh, and again, it's going to take those various meetings over the next month. But first and foremost, what we have done is we put the monies in a balanced budget so we can have those conversations in earnest. And we've positioned our financial plan. So when we say phase two, in essence, that's the beginnings of balancing the FY24 budget. Um, and, and again, I think our, our money is where our mouth is. Uh, and because again, while the public safety and teacher pay plans were large initiatives last year, we did not put them on a shelf. They have stayed on our desk and we are revisiting them annually, again, as long as there's a competitive market for us to recruit and retain. Thank you, Dr. Casey, it's, and it's a good point. And, and um, we've had good discussions, I think, about trying to make certain that the people who need these increases the most are getting them. And um, sometimes, you know, uh, working to um, balance out uh, other considerations that, that maybe others, uh, other employees and other administrators may have. So I appreciate that very much uh, and that effort that is ongoing. So thank, thank you, Dr. Casey. And if I could just make one, one final comment, I'd just like to say thanks to our budget staff and uh, Mr. Harris, you know, HR, we get to stand up here and deliver, you know, the great news of what we can do and what we can come up with, but we could not do this without having a budget team that is in lockstep with us. It has been great to work with them. They understand, you know, the, the people part of it, and it's just been a pleasure to have them on, on our team. All right, Matt, you get a kudo. <laughs> he told me to say that. <laughs> And the kudo has been taken away. Yeah, uh, that's right. I'm not surprised, Mr. Harris. <laughs> Chief Senate. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Casey. I'd like to start this afternoon by taking you back in time to last fiscal year. The county's public safety compensation package had become much less competitive in the region. 
The salaries of many veteran public safety employees have become compressed through stagnant wage growth in the years following the Great Recession. During a time when salary adjustments were focused primarily on starting pay, and those with five years or less of service. And our public safety agencies were experiencing record high employee turnover. This board recognized this was not sustainable and invested over $13.5 million to implement a hybrid public safety step plan uniformly applied to minimize compression among tenured employees and prevent leapfrogging by those similarly classified employees with less experience. To create the headroom necessary to implement the new pay plan, public safety starting salaries in Chesterfield remained unchanged. As Mary noted earlier, the new public safety pay plan had an immediate positive effect on the attrition rates of our public safety agencies, especially in retaining our most experienced employees. As illustrated in this slide, in the fire and EMS department alone, our total turnover was cut nearly in half as the new pay plan was implemented. There have been no normal service retirements of firefighters throughout the current fiscal year, and I only anticipate one more before the end of the fiscal year. So this has been a great retention tool, as Mr. Carroll <coughs> pointed out earlier. Now, fast forward one year, and you can see that in this highly competitive market, many other localities in the region have raised the starting salaries for police officers, firefighters, and sheriff's deputies, and are now well ahead of Chesterfield. In comparing similar sized localities in the region, the starting salary for a Chesterfield police officer is now 14% behind Henrico, whereas the starting salary for a Chesterfield sheriff's deputy is nearly 12% behind Henrico. The margins are even greater when you consider that the Chesterfield Police Department is 17% behind Goochland and the Chesterfield Sheriff's Office is 14% behind Hanover in starting salaries. And these are two localities that are only 7% and 30% of the population base of Chesterfield County, respectively. Moreover, the starting salary for a Chesterfield firefighter is 17% behind Henrico, and one-third of Chesterfield's current firefighters are below Henrico's starting salary. A new firefighter hired today by Chesterfield Fire and EMS will take four years to surpass the current starting salary in Henrico. There are likely similar scenarios in both the police department and the sheriff's office. Accordingly, recruiting new employees remains a real challenge for public safety, as well as retaining less tenured employees who can be lured away to higher paying positions and other public safety agencies or to more lucrative opportunities in the private sector where there is also better work-life balance. This situation will become even more challenging in the coming months as some localities consider raising starting salaries even further for public safety. To that end, the county administrator has included $13 million in his proposed FY 2023 budget to address starting salaries for police officers, firefighters, and sheriff's deputies, and to cover next year's step increases in the new public safety step plan. The public safety pay plan work group continues to develop an implementation strategy that will achieve competitive starting salaries for our public safety professionals, yet maintain the continuity of the step plan and avoid compression. While we don't have a lot of answers for you today, uh, it's important to note that while the uh, final implementation strategy is under development, it must first be approved by the county administrator before we can move forward. The investments proposed by the county administrator in both the public safety and general compensation areas will be critical if we are to attract and retain top talent, not only for those who wear the uniform and serve on the front lines, but also for those civilians embedded in our public safety departments who work tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure our operational success. The County Administrator's FY 2023 proposed budget uh, funds various operational improvements for public safety. Regarding fire and EMS, $906,000 is proposed for the full year costs of ongoing operations of the new Midlothian Fire Station that will open in late FY 2022 or early FY 2023. The 20 positions to support expanded services from the new station have been hired and are in recruit school. The new ladder truck is being outfitted at the vendor in Chester, and the delivery of the new ambulance is anticipated later this year. The FY 2023 proposed budget also includes just over a half million dollars 
to hire 12 new firefighters in January in furtherance of the department staffing plan that was developed in FY 2017. Now you may recall the goal of this plan is to reduce reliance on firefighters working long hours of overtime on their days off and in particular mandatory or forced overtime just to meet minimum staffing needs. The county's five-year plan recommends six additional firefighters in each of four successive years for minimum staffing coverage, bringing the department ever closer to a stable relief factor for ensuring around-the-clock operations. The five-year plan also recommends the assumption of salary costs beginning in FY 2024 for the additional positions initiated with ARPA, or American Rescue Plan Act funding, to support the department's mobile integrated health care program and to stand up peak demand ambulances. <clears throat> The proposed five-year capital improvement program includes funding for a public safety training space study uh, beginning in FY 2023. The Eanes Pittman Public Safety Training Center opened in the mid-1990s and the Enon Public Safety Training Center followed soon thereafter in the early 2000s. Since that time, our public safety agencies have grown and the Sheriff's Office has been included as a full partner in our training facilities. Accordingly, a study is needed to plan for necessary expansions to keep up with public safety training needs into the future. The CIP also recommends funding for key fire and EMS projects in the Bermuda, Clover Hill, and Matoaca Magisterial Districts, contingent upon voter approval of the November bond referendum. These projects include the replacement of the Chester and Ettrick fire stations and major renovations of the Clover Hill and Dutch Gap fire stations. An important responsibility in my role as fire chief is to not only assess current fire and EMS needs in the community, but to also look ahead 5, 10, and even 20 years into the future. As such, my last few slides today are intended to give the board a sense of the needs that may lie ahead as our community grows and fire and EMS demands continue to increase. In the short term, there are several outstanding operational needs that may require additional attention by the board. First, the Fire and EMS Department has applied for a federal Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response, or SAFER grant, that if approved will support the employment of 20 firefighters for minimum staffing coverage. Grant awards should be announced this fall, and if we are successful, we could be hiring the new firefighters as early as January of 2023. The county would then be obligated to assume the salary cost for these positions beginning in FY 2026. If awarded the grant, we'll work with Matt Harris on the assistance needed with initial training and outfitting costs for the new firefighters. At the end of the day, the return on investment would be significant and that we can move ahead much faster toward a 1.3 relief factor for minimum staffing coverage, with the federal government covering the salaries for the first three years of the grant, totaling nearly $4.3 million. If, however, we are unsuccessful in securing the grant this year, we will request that the board adopt the minimum staffing recommendations outlined in the five-year plan in future budgets and increase by one the number of firefighters hired in each successive year. A second operational concern is sustainable coverage by our volunteer rescue squads. While some rescue squads such as Forest View have reported recent successes in the recruitment of new members, other squads have struggled to consistently meet staffing benchmarks. We are now well into our fourth straight year of slow declining coverage by the Manchester Volunteer Rescue Squad from their main station at Courthouse and Hull Street Roads. Based on their average weekly staffing levels thus far this year, uh, this EMS district is now uncovered, often on short notice, for up to 30 hours per week on average on weeknights and weekends. In turn, this district must then be covered when it's, un when it's not staffed by the second, third, and fourth busiest career ambulances in the system which only further erodes the response reliability in each of their respective EMS districts. If Manchester's coverage continues to fall, it may be necessary to come back to the board to request an additional four firefighters to take this service area to half-time career coverage or to up to eight additional firefighters should full-time career coverage become necessary. Unmet capital needs in the Fire and EMS Department on the immediate horizon include completion of the E9 Public Safety Training Center by constructing a permanent fire support building to replace multiple temporary structures being used for bathroom, shower, and classroom facilities. Construction of a public safety boat storage and deployment facility in Rivers Bend in concert with a planned public boat launch in the area. And renovation of the Buford Fire Station and replacement of the Manchester Fire Station. 
Finally, consideration will need to be given to adding the Phillips Fire Station on the list for future replacement as this limited facility has transitioned from an all-volunteer operation in the past decade to a fully career-staffed, around-the-clock operation. No outlook on the future will be complete without consideration of the implications of population growth on service demands. Both the Weldon Cooper and the county demographers' projections for cumulative population growth in the county over the next five years are somewhat tempered. However, the recent release of population estimates for Virginia and its counties and cities shows that Chesterfield County grew by 5,395 residents between April 1 of 2020 and July 1 of 2021 an amount higher than any other locality listed in the study in the Commonwealth and a shift that bears watching in the coming years. In many areas of the county, construction is well underway of large single-family dwellings, townhomes, multi-family apartments, and mixed-use developments that will create many new and unique risks to which public safety must adapt. The county's planning department recently reported there are over 16,000 housing units in the development pipeline that could move ahead to construction over the next five years. One of the biggest drivers in EMS volume will almost certainly continue to be the age wave that is upon us, in which 15.7% of the population will be 65 years of age or older by FY 2027. Given our experience over the past five years, um, a cumulative increase in fire and EMS demand between 17.5% and 52.5% over the next five years would not be unexpected. Similar metrics from my public safety partners will likely tell the same story. Increased population and changing demographics equal the need for more firefighters, police officers, sheriff's deputies, and emergency communicators to keep up with the growing demand for essential public safety services. As we look beyond the next five years, it will be important to consider service level enhancements that may be necessary in the future as the county continues to grow. Now this slide is a little busy right now because the transition doesn't work on this particular presentation, but the map before you presents our current fire station shaded in black with future fire stations that are listed in the public facilities plan shaded in red. The gold shaded areas on the map represent a four minute drive time, which is a consistent standard for spacing fire stations in more densely populated areas. Some of the new stations likely to be rec recommended first for future consideration are as follows. In the Dale District, there is the proposed Five Forks Fire Station, a project that was approved by voters in the 2004 bond referendum. Although various developments in the immediate service area have been slow to move forward, this fire station will be of strategic value to the entire system due to its central location in the county with quick access to Route 288. In an area of the county where the Dale, Matoica, and Bermuda districts converge, there is the proposed Highlands Fire Station. This station has been in and out of the CIP in recent years, and once open, this station will address fire protection needs for the highest concentration of homes in the county in an ISO Class 10 area, where homeowner insurance is often difficult to obtain and premiums tend to be much higher than other areas of the county. In the Midlothian District, there is the proposed Old Hundred Fire Station that will be needed as development continues to the west of the village of Midlothian and along the future Woolridge Road connection. And finally, in the Matoaga District, there will likely be the need for a fire station in the upper Magnolia Green area to help protect future economic development opportunities and maintain acceptable response times on the western side of the future Powhite Parkway extension. It's important to note that the basic cost estimates provided for these stations have not been fully vetted by the Department of General Services and were developed before the current inflationary pattern set in. Standing here today, it's difficult to uh, predict what these costs may be in five or 10 years, and these estimates may change based on the timing of construction and any unique site development challenges encountered. Nonetheless, you can still get a, a good sense of the magnitude of the future investments that may be necessary to keep up with growing service demands in the fire and EMS department. In closing, I want to express the appreciation of all of our public safety members for this board's efforts over the past few years to improve compensation and provide needed support in the areas of staffing, equipment, and facilities. This is a testament, testament to your commitment to those who place their lives on the line each day in service to our community. 
Mr. Chairman, this completes my presentation today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions the board may have at this time. Well, Chief, let me just say uh, we appreciate you, and we appreciate the men and women of the fire service who are out there. Uh, what seems to be like almost daily yes. recently, you all have been, have been in a um, in a tough spot uh, the last couple of weeks, and I, I see you responding to accidents and fires. You've had some some fires, uh, real fires to deal with. Um, of late, and so I appreciate. Uh, wanted to say the um, public uh, publication of the pictures on the Facebook page and the social media because I think that helps paint a picture for our citizens to see what you all do day in and day out, and I think it's invaluable. So uh, that uh, I think helps educate the public, particularly in a budget uh, season when they see requests, uh, they can understand. Uh, what they're going toward and so I uh, just want to say thank you for that board Absolutely. members. Thank you um, Other board members have comments. Mr. Holland. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for your outstanding service in the entire fire department You all do a tremendous job uh, Protecting this county and you're so highly valued and appreciated by all the citizens that I talk to and I appreciate your service in regards to one question in regards to the sites you mentioned I appreciate your forward thinking uh, particularly Five Forks and the Highlands uh, in terms of purchasing the land for those sites, uh, since we know we'll need them in five to seven years, is that something we're contemplating doing, or is that we'll, have we done it, or what is your thoughts in that so area, those, sir? Sir, those two stations that you mentioned, we already have the site secured. Uh, there was land proffered as part of the Highlands development uh, for a fire station and elementary school, future elementary school at that location. And then uh, Courthouse in 288 may recall that we um, had property transitioned. Uh, we, we extended the water line for the church, and in turn, we got the property uh, probably about 10 years ago. But we have both of those sites. Uh, right now, we're working on a site in Chester and uh, trying to get a site secured there. It's uh, uh, somewhat difficult because of the, the development in that area. Uh, but pretty much every other site that we've mentioned today or for future fire stations has been secured already. Excellent. Thank you so very much. We greatly appreciate that. Mr. Engel. We've worked hard to uh, increase public safety compensation, and it looks like we have some more work to do. But as I always say to um, schools and li liaison meetings, um, what are the other issues that um, affect employment? And I'm not sure on the fire side, but I know on the police side, we've had a lot of um, lateral moves from other departments coming to Chesterfield, mm -hmm. even when I look at some of the challenges we have on compensation, which to me says that we're doing something, we're, we're, we focus on compensation as a piece of the package, but our public safety system is so highly sought out that we're actually filling roles even when we're not exactly where our competition is. So um, I think that that's a testament to all of our public safety. Yes, sir. Good comments, and, and thank you, Chief, for this presentation. And I, I might just oh, add Ms. Haley. Our, our Midlothian citizens are so excited about this new fire station. It's we really are too. like coming to, now you sort of see it really <laughs> coming to fruition. So it's not it's much very, longer, hopefully. It's very, right, it's very <laughs> exciting. Well, you know, we can't, supply chain issues we can't control. So <laughs> trying to, to um, take that into consideration, but it looks really great. Well, thank you. We're excited to get that online. Mr. Carroll. Um, I know we didn't get to have an official uh, open house or grand opening at Company 25, but I know that a lot of people from the community uh, have stopped by, taken a look at the station. Um, very impressed with it. I've been there several times myself. Um, but I want to um, echo uh, what my colleagues just said, and I, I do, especially the last part that Mr. Engel said, which is I do believe that we have created an environment in our public safety system that is very um, enviable uh, to uh, everyone who hears about it. Um, and I think that is about um, a lot of things, leadership at the top all the way to the bottom. So it's not just uh, the top leadership, but our your first line supervisors who actually have to keep the employees happy um, are doing a great job. And um, I, you know, it's amazing. Uh, so thank you, and thank you to the 
to the men and women of all of our public safety, fire, police, and sheriff. Um, I think we have some of the best organizations in the United States right now, and I think it's probably a, we shouldn't keep it a best kept secret anymore. We should push <laughs> it out even more. I would agree with you wholeheartedly. We do have a great organization here. Great team. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Chief. Good afternoon, George. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Dr. Casey, how are you? Great to be here tonight. Really excited and honored to present to you the Department of Utilities fiscal year 23 budget. Uh, before we get started, I did want to thank the board for your continued support of the Department of Utilities and support not only for our financial plans, but also support of our employees as they strive to provide exceptional service to our customers. Your support plays an integral role in our success and your leadership really inspires our employees to try to better serve our customers in new ways. On this slide is our mission statement. Our mission statement and goals in the Department of Utilities truly sets us aside from other utilities across the nation as demonstrated by an array of notable accomplishments, including some of the most competitive utility rates, recognition for high quality water, and a staff dedicated to continuously improving our business and operational processes. We are truly committed to provide high quality service in a financially managed way, which results in a great quality product for our customers at affordable rates. In Chesterfield County, uh, the average residential customer uses seven CCF. That's about 5,250 gallons. As this board knows, we have long-term financial rate models that's, that uh, recommends very, very small but um, regular rate increases to avoid rate shock and smoothly those uh, rates out so that we can meet our obligations for replacement of infrastructure as it continues to age. Uh, this year, our cost of service analysis indicates we need a slight increase to our commodity charge, which is our volume charge for both water and wastewater. We are proposing an 11 cent increase uh, to the commodity charge for both water and wastewater. If you do the math, that converts out to about a penny increase for every 68 gallons used. So for the proposed rates, our average residential customer that uses seven CCF will see a monthly increase on their combined water and wastewater bill of $1.54. We are proposing no increases in the connection fees for both water or wastewater. And on the slide to the right, you can see we plotted out the CPI index the top uh, line shows the CPI index for all categories. And again, that was ending in December. It almost reached 7%. There was a presentation before that it's currently at 7.5%. That's a 40-year high uh, for the 12-month for the average. We also, another uh, indice that we track is that one that's specific to water and wastewater. It's a, a subcategory of the total CPI, and it's water and wastewater um, uh, maintenance, and that's currently at 2.83% ending December. So you can see our proposed rates are very competitive and with uh, the CPI. On this slide, we benchmark with localities in the region. This is using Chesterfield County's average usage of seven CCF and applying that volume to each of our rates. On this slide, this is Chesterfield County's proposed fiscal year 23 rates, so the, the proposed new rates compared to those localities around us using their, their existing rates. As you can see, we are extremely competitive in the region on our rates, and we do anticipate these localities to also be asking for a rate increase, which would make our rates even more favorable. We also are proposing an increase on our water service line charges. As you know, most water service lines in Chesterfield County gets uh, installed by developers in new development and they are donated to the utilities after completion of the project. We do have some customers that need water service lines installed. If there's a customer whose well goes dry and they need to connect to the public system, or if they're building a single house on a lot, we do offer that service for our crews to come out and install that service line. Our customers always have the option to hire a contractor if they feel they can get a more competitive rate. The most, uh, the, the most residential customers use a three-quarter inch service line with a five-eighths inch meter, that's that top line, our current rate is $1,900. We are proposing the rate go up $900 to $2,800. Uh, and we are seeing increases, uh, similar increases in the different sized uh, service lines um, 
I will tell you that we haven't had a rate increase uh, in this category in five years. And again, it's just to cover the increased cost of labor and materials. We also are proposing increase uh, in our companion meter charges. A companion meter is used for outside irrigation for our residential customers, and that is going up from $620 to $800, which is a $180 increase. We also are proposing a slight increase to our strong waste surcharges. Uh, these surcharges only apply to our permitted industrial customers who send stronger than normal residential waste to our wastewater treatment plants, and it costs us more money to treat that waste. So we regularly calculate the cost to, to treat that stronger waste so that our industries pay their fair share of their discharges to our wastewater treatment facilities. We actually have four strong waste categories. We're proposing a one penny increase in our BOD category. BOD is biological oxygen demand and our TSS category, which is our total suspended solids. We are proposing no increases in our total nitrogen or total phosphorus surcharges. And the average, uh, we have 35 permitted industries right now, the average increase would be about 1.6% for, for those uh, 35 industries. And again, this does not apply to residential or your commercial accounts, just those, those large industrial permitted customers. Our total operating budget is proposed at $85.1 million. This is a $5.7 million increase from the previous year. We, as you can see on the chart, we have three co main categories in our operating budget. We have our operating category, our capital outlay, and our personnel. Our operating category is by far the largest category at $54.9 million. We are seeing a $2 million increase in our operating category. Um, and listed here are some of the reasons why we're seeing that $2 million increase. As previously indicated, one of the challenges we're having is timely delivery of treatment chemicals and also cost. This is an 18% increase from our current budget or $900,000 for treatment chemicals. We also see in purchase water increase by $250,000. And there's two reasons for that. One is as we continue to grow, we're projecting to the need to purchase more water, which is a good thing. So this is just on the expense side of the house. But we also anticipate on the revenue side of the house to see increased revenues. We're also seeing the city of Richmond's rate increase by 3%. We also see an increased cost in our purchase wastewater treatment. We're one of five members of the South Central Wastewater Authority, and the majority of that $150,000 is increases at that facility. We're also seeing across the board increases in raw materials and services, about $500,000 there. And that accounts for about the um, $1.8 million of the $2 million increase. Our um, next category is our capital outlay, and is by far the smallest. Can you stop for one second? Yes, sir. So the water we purchase from the city of Richmond, their rate is higher than our rate, but do we have a um, negotiated price with them that, are, is it costing us more than we're receiving from our customers to use that water? So our customer rate in Chesterfield is lower than the city of Richmond's customer rate, but the way the contract is set up, we contractually pay for the services they provide. So it's a a contract that our staff go through every year to make sure they're charging us appropriately in accordance to that contract that was set up in 1989. In addition to that, we also pay our fair share of the infrastructure that feeds Chesterfield County. So one of the benefits that we that the city has with Chesterfield is we contribute to their capital cost of that infrastructure in the neighborhood of three to four million dollars a year to replace aging infrastructure that serves us. So that's it's a mutually beneficial agreement with the city of Richmond. They're glad we have the contract. We're, gl we're glad to have the water in the area of the county where we have the highest demand. It is by far our largest, um, most expensive cost per water per gallon. Uh, but again, when you're in the water industry, um, diversity is key and reliability and redundancy is key. Um, it's still a good rate, um, but our other supplies do are a more affordable rate. But this does allow us flexibility on how we operate the system. Thank you. Um, next category is capital outlay. That's the smallest category in operating budget at $1.7 million. That category does fluctuate depending on what vehicles and equipment we need. And you can see uh, that's increased $430,000. You can see we have a replacement tandem dump truck, four service vehicles, a trailer mounted valve operating unit. We're replacing some of the closed caption TV cameras that we use to uh, inspect the sewer system and uh, putting some security cameras on our administration building. The last category in operating budget is our personnel category at $28.5 million. This is a $3.3 million increase over the current budget. 
Uh, those increases include that 2% merit increase that we anticipate to happen in January. And we're also mirroring the general fund's uh, methodology on how to uh, uh, plan and budget for the county's classification and compensation study. We are requesting two additional positions, as well as a four-man water repair maintenance crew. Uh, and these positions are really uh, to, to continue to maintain and operate our growing system. Our capital project spending 10-year plan um, is $125 million. This is by far our largest uh, long-term financial expenditures. And this is the number that really drives our rates. Um, if you talk about what drives your rates, it's really your capital, um, just because of the large expenditures you have. You can see, um, you know, this board knows we have very strong financial policies. We have a very strong rate stabilization reserve that we continue to comply with. We have a 10-year rate model. A lot of utilities may have a two- or three-year rate model. We go out 10 years so that we can avoid rate shock and smoothly uh, transition the rates to meet our financial obligations. So extremely uh, well-run system and the envy of a lot of the um, utilities in the region. I often get calls from other utility directors on how we have this set up, and we gladly share our financial policies. Uh, as you can see on this slide, about half of the CIP is really, uh, it's, it's about 52% of the CIP is for the replacement of aging infrastructure, and that includes the maintenance and rehab category as well as our obligations under that city of Richmond contract we just spoke of. Uh, as our systems, as, as the demand continues to grow in Chesterfield, we're also spending about 48% of our CIP over the next 10 years on expanding our existing facilities. This would be increasing sizes of pipes, uh, expansion of our Proctor's Creek uh, wastewater treatment plant, as well as that fourth water supply we have planning. And you can see that's about 48% um, of our total CIP. In our 10-year capital plan, we do have a lot of exciting projects. Um, I always like to highlight some of our more significant projects across the county. There's five highlighted here, one for each district. Uh, we do have uh, green represents sewer in my business, so uh, we do have a um, fairly large um, wastewater uh, plant project in the Bermuda district, and then we have four uh, water projects that we'll briefly go over. So in the Bermuda District, we have the Proctor's Creek Flow Equalization Basin. That's a massive $58.4 million project. It's actually a 12 million gallon, gallon flow equalization basin expandable to 18 million gallon, gallons. Just to give you an idea of the size of this facility, this is the size of a football field, 51 feet deep. So just massive facility. In addition to the actual basin, we're actually constructing a pump station, some coarse uh, a grit and grit removal, coarse screens and grit removal, uh, as well as we're going to have to relocate Dominion Power's primary and secondary feeds to that facility in order to construct this. Um, what equalization basins do, and if you all have ever been to our Falling Creek plant, we do have an equalization basin at Falling Creek. We don't currently at Proctor's Creek. This does a number of things. During normal flows, this not only acts as a shock, a shock absorber for the flows coming into the plant, but also, um, we have mixers in those basins that, um, so, so it, uh, you have homogeneous loadings within that wastewater that's fed into the plant. And if you talk to any plant operator, they'll tell you if you can feed in a constant flow rate and a constant loading rate, it makes their job so much easier. They can really dial in and get that efficiency up. Um, so we're saving money for our customers operationally. The other thing that this does is during high flow events, like high rain events, our staff can empty these basins and they act as a huge shock absorber to take those high flows that can fl slowly be fed into the plant. What this does is if you didn't have these flow equalization basins, you have to spend a lot of money on capital to get your permitted capacity to plant to meet that peak flow. By doing this, you're shaving off those peaks and you're pushing out the need to spend that significant amount of capital which uh, you save on debt service and operating, and again, a huge cost savings for our customers. The project is currently on design. It'll take about a year and a half to construct, and we're hoping by March 25 we'll be done with that project. Uh, in the Clover Hill District, Mr. Winslow, we have two projects to present to you. One I'm sure you'll be happy about is the CARP Barrier Project, which uh, is a $1.5 million project that we're going to be coming to the board in a couple weeks for approval. Uh, as you know, the, we've been, um, uh, we identified the invasive weed hydrilla in the Swift Creek Reservoir. We've been um, focused on the biological control, which is an introduction of triploid grass carp um, to consume the hydrilla to keep it at bay um, so that not only we have a great water supply, but we have a great recreational resources for the communities around there. 
One of the challenges we've had over the past years, especially 2018 and 2020, with the massive flooding, the um, in-house design cart barrier that we had uh, just gets totally inundated, and um, the loss of the, the carp in the reservoir is unknown, but it's increased. So it makes it more challenging on how to predict how many carp to add to the reservoir. This carp barrier will be more robust, will be able to withstand additional flooding, and will help us better estimate on how many carp to introduce into the reservoir each year so we can keep that hydrilla at bay. Is this like a net? So this is on top. This is on top of the dam. It will be some netting. It will be some steel with netting in between. The, the carp barrier is designed so that if there's any debris that comes down, we only lose one section instead of the entire section. And then you can also see in this slide there also be a debris boom. One of the challenges we have during high flood events, if you get a tree or something that goes into the reservoir, or in the past we've had customers' docks come 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 out the uh, the netting uh, during that 2020 flood. This debris barrier will push the debris to the side as opposed to, to, to focusing mainly on the carp barrier. So uh, this project is already, uh, design is complete. It'll take less than six months to complete. We'll have this done by the end of the year. The other project is the flocculators and effluent launders replacement. This is part of our treatment process that um, removes sediment from the, the, from the treated water. That's a $5 million project. This is replacing original equipment from 1967. Uh, design is complete on that. Uh, we anticipate that project to be done by May 24. Mr. Holland in the Dale District, we have another reliability and re, um, a resiliency project on the Hopkins Road to Route 1 waterline. That's a $8.5 million project. We have two miles of 16-inch water line going in there. We basically have two feeds from the city of Richmond currently, Hopkins and Drank Road. This Hopkins Road, what this is going to allow us to do is be able to, if we need it, take more, more water from the city of Richmond and bring it into your, your uh, customer zones. Uh, it's going to increase the transmission capacity from our Centralia, to our Centralia and Bellwood zone. Um, and that's going to help us not only provide our customers great water pressure, but also provide for fire protection and also have added capacity for um, redevelopment in those areas. So that's, that's a great project coming. Design is complete. They're doing the easement acquisition right now. We plan to have that project online by June 24. Uh, Mr. Carroll, um, the, in the Matoag District, we have the Otterdale Road Interconnection Project. I know you're very familiar with this project. It's a $3.1 million project. Again, another reliability and redundancy project. It's about a mile and a half of 16-inch water line. Right now, our, one of our facilities plan about uh, many years ago identified that we have over 1,300 customers west of the Swift Creek Reservoir that's fed by one 16-inch water line on the Genito Bridge Crossing. If we lose that water line, those customers will be out of service until we can get it repaired. And as you know, it's a bridge crossing, so that may be a difficult repair, so it may be an extended period of time. This project um, runs about a mile and a half of water line up Otterdale Road from Woolridge Road um, to Westerly um, and brings in a second feed to that area. So if we were to have a break, those customers would remain into service. The other great thing that this project does is it, it um, the area that it's tapping into is Appomattox River Water uh, authority water. Um, the, the property, the uh, areas west of the reservoir right now are fed by Addison Evans. So it actually has a second supply. So it gives us flexibility on how we can operate the system if we have any kind of emergencies, which is always a great thing. Um, design is uh, ongoing. Uh, it should be done designed by July 22. This construction on this project will follow closely behind CDOT's bridge construction project that's uh, ongoing right now and we anticipate construction to be complete sometime around July uh, 2024, so the summer of 2024. And we're coordinating with um, CDOT and parties to make sure that um, uh, we're coordinating with all needs on this project. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Carroll. So you'll think you have this done by the time they get their, their bridge projects fixed out there? So we're allowing them to go first with their bridge projects. Once they complete their bridge project, we'll follow back through with our construction. How long? It's about, the project's about a year and a half, and we figure it will be done by the summer of 2024. And I can, I can speak with you further about this project. Let's do that. Yes, sir. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, Mr. Chair, is um, we had had a conversation uh, about the, uh, Hydrilla problem down at Lake Chesden now. Are there any plans to put any carp in Chesden? There are no plans right now. Right now, there. Um, it reminds me of where we were back in 2009. 
They're trying to assess um, the footprint of the hydrilla and the density of the hydrilla. I've been fortunately asked to also sit on that um, hydrilla group. Um, so I, I gladly uh, volunteered to also sit on that, that hydrilla group, and I think they're bringing uh, some experts in, including some folks from uh, Lake Gaston who have some experience. So they haven't determined what the action will be. They're more of an assessment phase right now. Um, that's going to be a little more difficult than the Swift Creek Reservoir just because it's a, um, a, the size of it and the size of the facilities and things. So we may have to come up with some creative ideas on how to address that issue. Last but not least, in Midlothian District, Mrs. Haley, we have the Province and Woodward Road Waterline Project. That's a $3.3 million project. Again, another reliability and redundancy project. Uh, it's just under a mile of 16-inch pipe. We're replacing 16-inch um, pipe that is over 55 years old and at the end of its useful life, and we're replacing it with larger capacity 20 and 24-inch pipe. This will go on um, South Providence Road, basically from Midlothian Turnpike to Woodward Road, and then it'll head east to our Elkhart Elevated Tank. It's a two million gallon tank to complete that project. Um, design is ongoing. We estimate design to be completed in January 23, with construction completed somewhere in December 2025. We're really excited about our 10 year CIP and some of the state of the art projects we have. Uh, a lot of project engineers are really excited about it. But we're also really proud of our past accomplishments, some of them shown on this slide. And we do appreciate the board support because we really need your support and appreciate your support for not only our past successes, but our future. And with that, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Questions from board members? George, thank you. Uh, outstanding as always. And uh, we so appreciate uh, the effort um, day in and day out of, of our folks in utilities. And uh, I think people just don't realize when they cut on the the water, where it all comes from and how it all works, but um, you make it seamless and painless and effortless. And uh, so we appreciate you, we appreciate your staff, and uh, we appreciate this presentation and bringing us up to speed on where you are on these projects that are serving all of Chesterfield. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hayes. Mr. Hayes. Mr. I said thank you, Mr. Hayes, thank for you. your outstanding job, for outstanding department. It continues to excel and do well and have great people. So we appreciate your excellence and service uh, to the county and our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Durkin headed to dinner, so I'll, uh, I'll wrap this up for you all. But um, so this kind of transitions us into the, the community portion of, uh, of the budget season. So we begin tomorrow night uh, in this room with, uh, with the Dale District. And so these are hybrid events, so we have uh, capacity for people to participate in person. But the, uh, you know, even right at the beginning of the pandemic, we transitioned this over to Facebook Live, and it's worked, you know, very, very well. So we have a dedicated night for each district, but there's no, uh, you know, we don't check any papers at the door. Uh, it's welcome to the entire uh, community if they want to come out. Can't make one of the, the dates for their specific district. We'll wrap that up. On the 22nd, the public hearing is in this room in two weeks on the 23rd, and then another two weeks of, uh, of deliberation is sort of final touches for we adopt on April the 6th. With that, happy to take any questions on anything you've heard today. Questions for Mr. Harris? Yes. What time does the public community uh, meeting 6:30 start? 6.30 tomorrow. At 6.30 p.m. And that's for each of these communities? Yes, sir. Meeting, correct. Uh, that's tomorrow. Thank you. And then, you know, as, as always, we do have the, uh, the blueprint portal is up and we, you know, we take a lot of questions there. Really, uh, it's, it's established itself. And so we get inquiries uh, year round, but certainly this time of year, that's another great way to, uh, to reach us and, and get information if you need it. Well, thank you. Uh, this is, I think we've had some good presentations today and um, uh, we're looking forward to hearing what the public has to say about um, this and uh, what they think the um, budget, the direction of the budget and where, where it should go. So we appreciate you.